Howdy folks! Welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. This week we have another review for you, but it's not Steampunk. I have to say though that if not for Steampunk, I never would have read this book. I only read sci-fi and fantasy pretty much were the only kinds of fiction I read for a lot of years, but Steampunk served as the gateway drug in getting me into things like the classics, reading like a lot of Dickens books and uh, Dumas and other great writers of the past, and also got me into historical fiction from the modern times. This book is one of those. This particular novel I'm going to discuss is often considered a western because it takes place mostly in the western USA in the late 1800s, but it's not a stereotypical western. It's got cowboys and Indians and lawmen and outlaws as you would expect, but it's so much more it's so much more than a simple morality tale, like a lot of Westerns are. It's complex. And it has a lot of things that steampunk t tends to have, like real-life historical characters in fictional scenarios. And also, like steampunk, it has a strong element of the mythic and the fantastical at times. I'm talking about Thomas Berger's 1964 novel, Little Big Man. Some of you may remember Little Big Man from the movie, which was made in 1970, especially those of you who are as old as I am. <laughs> I saw that back in high school. And anyway, it was kind of a Western comedy at the time, starring Dustin Hoffman, Faye Dunaway, and Chief Dan George. And so later on, much later on, I decided I was going to read the book. And I ended up enjoying it a lot more than I had enjoyed the movie. Now, Little Big Man is the story of Jack Crab. It's told as the rambling memories of a 111-year-old man to a historical scholar with a tape recorder. Now, the movie they make 121, so it can happen in 1970, which is kind of dumb, but bear with me. Other than a bit of setup in the beginning, the book is all Crab's narration. And though the tale is quite fantastic, we kind of want to believe him because it's, it's so much fun. The defining moment of his life is in the late 1850s when he's traveling west in a covered wagon with his family. And they encounter a band of the natives who end up slaughtering all the adults and he gets taken in by the Cheyenne tribe and raised as one of their own. He's going to be part of neither society because he's not really a Cheyenne and he's no longer really white. Little Big Man, the name, is the name that they give him because he is very short but he's also very brave in battle. And it's a complicated book and young Jack has a lot of adventures with all of these historical settings and all of these historical people that people who love history of the West, like myself, really enjoy. Living with the Cheyenne for his formative years, uh, from the age of 10 onwards, he learns all their ways, including their language, and how to ride, shoot, hunt, and make war. And although he develops a deep attachment to his Cheyenne tribe, the band that he's with, and his adopted family, particularly his adopted father, Old Lodgeskins, he knows he doesn't really fit in. And there's, you know, a lot of resentment towards him from other young men of the tribe. And particularly there's this rivalry between one of them and him. I forget the guy's name at the moment, unfortunately. But during a battle with white soldiers, he surrenders. And they're about to shoot him. He says, wait, 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 I'm a white man. I've been held prisoner. They take him with them. And he's a teenager now, so they give him to a white family as, you know, a foster son. And it's a, it's a preacher. The, this new guy's a preacher, just like his old, his original white father. Anyway, later on, he marries a Swedish woman named Olga, has a child with her, but they are carried away with an, by another Indian raid. So it's like one thing after another. Much, much later, he returned to the tribe and takes a new wife, 
the young, beautiful Sunshine and ends up kind of inheriting her sisters as well. So he's got three wives. <laughs> it's a pretty idyllic life. I mean, he's, he's, uh, have a, has a child on the way. He's very happy about that. Unfortunately, a man comes in the way, George Armstrong Custer. And, and this is a historical event, too. It was like a raid on an Indian village. They had made peace with the whites, but they were going after a different band that had been attacking settlers. So this was entirely mistaken, and it was very vicious. And in the book, Jack's new wives and child are gone. And he's once again on his own. Later on, he ends up being a scout for Custer, and he thinks, gee, I hate this man. I should kill him. I, I, should, I should knife him in the back. <laughs> but he kind of ends up respecting Custer because although he's a narcissist and a real jerk, at the same time, he's very brave. He's very principled in his own way. So this is how Jack ends up being the sole white survivor of the Battle of Little Bighorn, just like, just like Harry Flashman was the lone white survivor of the Battle of Little Bighorn. <laughs> it's all great fun and a bit exaggerated and even farcical, maybe even cynical in places, with a lot of historical backing. So that's why I liked the book so much. The movie, of course, was how I first encountered it, quite memorable. After reading the book, I thought maybe they did change a few things, so I had to rewatch the movie, and of course they did. Uh, the first thing was to have the massacre be less offensive, which I don't blame them for. But then they played up a lot of things for laughs, and including this rivalry between this other young Cheyenne Brave and himself. Uh, for example, Little Big Man has three lovely young wives, whereas the other man, who has, who, whom Little Big Man hasn't seen in a while, has acquired this Swedish woman that they had captured, <laughs> or they had bought from another tribe, and it's Olga. And Olga is like just cruel and dominating, and she keeps saying, Why are you such a poor provider? I can't feed the family on this rabbit that you got me. Give me a deer. <laughs> She's terrible. <laughs> and Jack, Jack doesn't even want to acknowledge that this was once his wife. He says, fine. <laughs> but I still enjoyed the movie a lot. And, and Dustin Hoffman does a good job. I mean, he certainly fits the role in stature. And he seems clueless a lot of the time, which is how the character is supposed to be. He looks a little bit out of place because he's so Jewish and I just didn't imagine Jack Crabb that way because he comes from this very Protestant background. Nonetheless, Hoffman did a good job. When I discovered there was a sequel to the book, Return of Little Big Man, I had to get that one. I had to see what that one was like. Berger wrote it in 1999, 35 years after the original book. And the two Crabb books are among 23 books that Berger published during his lifetime. He died in 2014. So I haven't read any of the others, so I can't comment on anything else about his style. First question I had was how Berger was going to continue this book, because Crabbe has died at the end of the first book, after only telling about 30 years of his very fascinating life. I can imagine him thinking, Berger that is, gee, I really blew it because there's all this other great stuff that Jack could do and now I've had him die. So, in this book, we find out that Crab faked his own death. Not a difficult thing to do when you're 111. <laughs> He's got a conspiracy with the owner of the rest home who says, let's sell these reminiscences of yours as a you know, story to the papers. I'll get a cut of it and you'll get a cut and we'll make more money this time. So Jack says, sure. And so he steals the guy's tape recorder of this historian and he continues his story where he left off. So we follow Crab's adventures for another 30 years or so and he meets a lot of famous people and is present at a lot of amazing events such as the gunfight at the OK Corral. It's funny because that very short historical episode probably lasted all of 10 minutes is in so many books and so many movies, and it even featured in the first series 
of Star Trek when they these aliens were simulating it and Kirk and Spock had to be part of the doomed Clantons. <laughs> anyway, so Jack gets to witness that and he gets to meet all these people. And there was just something missing in the sequel though. The first one was more exaggerated, more farcical, and more humorous. And this one plays it more straight. There is humor in here and I did enjoy it, but the problem was the first one was so darn good, I kept comparing the second one against the first. Now I'm going to do my pros and cons, and of course a comparison of the two books and the movie. I really like this kind of book, where the hero participates in all these famous historical events. I was thinking, there must be a name for this, because the Flashman Papers was a lot like that, which I recently reviewed. Because Flashman is in all these things, like he was in the Battle of Little Bighorn, and he was in the massacre of the British troops by the Afghans, and all these other really famous events. So, I thought, also, like the movie Forrest Gump. Now, that's based on a book, which I haven't read, but same thing. He's in all these famous things. There must be a word for that. Well, I haven't found one. However, Wikipedia refers to Little Big Man as picaresque, which means that the hero is a likable rogue. The same could be said to apply to Flashman, even though he's not as likable. He's more of a rogue. They even apply this to Forrest Gump, not the movie. In the movie, he's just a sweet, mentally handicapped man who just kind of bumbles through life and is always trying to do the right thing. No, in the book, he's a savant, kind of like the character in Rain Man, if we want to bring up Dustin Hoffman again, and he is kind of a jerk at times, if what I understand, so therefore he fits that definition more correctly. Things I love about this book, I love the language, the home homespun, old-timey uh, reflections of Crab's view of the world. I love the way it portrays the Cheyenne in a very nuanced fashion. There are neither, like, beast like savages, like you would see in a lot of the old westerns, uh, nor are they noble flower children, like you might see them portrayed in the 1960s and 70s. They can be very cruel, and at the same time they have this sense of loyalty and honor that is very admirable. Crab refers to them as the human beings because that's what they call themselves. In fact, I think most ethnicities, the word that they call themselves essentially means that in whatever language that they they have. Now, as far as the difference in the massacres in the, in the book and the movie, now the movie, the Pawnee killed Jack's family, and then the Cheyenne came on later to rescue Jack and his brother. It's kind of ironic because in the book they keep referring to the Pawnee as the white man's lick spittles, basically, because the two tribes did not get along. In the book, the Cheyenne played both roles in kind of a bizarre way. Jack's father, who was also a traveling preacher, he was trying to be a good host to his uh, guests, and he had run out of coffee, so naively and rather foolishly, he breaks out a case of whiskey. <laughs> and now we know that a lot of Native Americans have problems with alcohol. It's very tragic, but this is a little over the top. This is really ridiculous. The uh, Natives get stinking drunk, they have a quarrel, end up killing all the adult members of the white party. The next morning when they wake up with their fierce hangovers, they say, wow, this is a tragedy, but we're not responsible because the white people put a spell on us, so therefore we are going to take in these two young boys and make it right by them, at least. So, although I tend to really appreciate stuff that's, you know, politically incorrect, like the Flashman stuff, where he's dallying with female slaves, and etc., etc. This was a bit much, even for me. <laughs> so, anyway, I just kind of thought, well, it's, it's a bit of an exaggeration and a farce. It's part of the dark comedy of the book. I don't blame the movie for changing it. I mean, it wouldn't have gone over well. <laughs> now, I love this nuanced view of the Cheyenne in the book. Jack is very frank about what he thinks about them at the beginning. He thinks the village stinks like a garbage dump. He thinks they're very uncouth and uncivilized. And he hates how they eat dog. But later on he becomes hungry and shares dog stew with the family. <laughs> they raise him in their ways and Old Lodgkins treats them like a son. I actually cried when Old Lodgkins died. 
not just because he was such a beloved father for Jack, but because he represented the death of a way of life. It's very sad, really, when you think about it. I have to make a little bit of a note about the Himone <laughs> while I'm at, at it, because it's a topic these days. The idea was that the tribe had occasional gay members, and that rather than ostracizing them, they would have them dress like women, and they could even marry a male member of the tribe, and live as women. And there was one such character called Little Horse. In the movie, they kind of play him up for comedy a little bit more. He's very effeminate, you know, of course, very flamboyant, let's say. <laughs> and it's hard to research this topic now. I tried, but you put in those words, a Native American transgender, and all you get is stuff about the two-spirit notion. Now, I think this is probably based on truth, but, of course, with the ideology, they probably give a one-sided view of it. And so I haven't yet found a more uh, authoritative story about this. There's also the thing about the preacher that Jack gets adopted by and his wife, who is played by Faye Dunaway in the movie. Now, in the book, he does develop a sexual obsession for this young, pretty woman. Uh, like a lot of the, the naughty, uh, naughty videos you may have heard about. <laughs> anyway, he very much wants to do his stepmom. But, you know, he's too much... He's still too much of a, you know, traditionalist to really attempt anything, but he starts following her around, and he discovers that she's not really all that innocent, that... You know, she's not as righteous, and she may be dallying with other men. Now, in the movie, of course, it's more lurid. It's like she's initiating him into the ways of a man. <laughs> and, of course, it's Faye Dunaway, so we enjoy, you know, seeing her be kind of uh, inappropriate. <laughs> so, anyway, the movie was fun, but I definitely like the book better. And, and at the moment, I can't think of any cons for it, except perhaps that massacre at the beginning. It was a little too much. I loved the movie when I saw it the first time. The second time, I thought it just didn't quite do the book justice. As for the second book, Crab continues on. He meets all sorts of great historical characters, like Wild Bill Hickok. Well, he's seen him already, but he sees him killed in this book. And the Earp Brothers, and of course, the O.K. Corral thing, and Buffalo Bill Cody. At one point, he joins the staff of an Indian boarding school, which is financed by well-meaning white liberals. <laughs> and they are trying to make them into good white Christians, which is kind of sad, you know, from our perspective. They're trying to wipe out their culture. But these whites think they're doing the right thing. It's there that he meets this independent-minded suffragette named Amanda Teasdale. And he falls madly in love with her, because she's so smart, and she's so cultured and refined. And, unfortunately, he has to leave the school under very dark and incriminating circumstances. So he's kind of been disgraced. Later, he ends up joining Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West show, and spends several years touring with them. And it's fascinating, all the things he sees, like they spend an entire year in New York City, and they are in Europe, they're in London and Paris, and all these places. And we get to meet Annie Oakley, who's quite a pistol, to coin a phrase. Uh, Sitting Bull, very noble, old, you know, grumpy, grumpy old warrior. <laughs> and other Western legends. But there just aren't as many edgy situations as in the first book, so I just couldn't enjoy it as much. Jack is less of a rogue. Uh, for example, he spends two years working for a brothel, and he doesn't even sample any of the women, even though they like him and would surely give him a turn in the hay for free. So he he's just didn't seem as roguish as I remembered him. The historical content and setting was very much fun, and I laughed a lot at Crab's whimsical observations, uh, his turn of phrase, and so on, but I got very frustrated with it, particularly because he's obsessed with Amanda, and he keeps encountering her, just like other people he keeps running into again and again. So it turns out Amanda realizes that he was not at fault. So she doesn't hate him, but she seems to view him with disdain. Jack is, of course, still mad about her, but he just doesn't have the gumption to make a move, which got me very frustrated. Here's a man who has faced death many times, but he's scared of this woman. Now, you would think 
that he would have progressed a little bit in his character to be a little bit less shy and a little bit more outgoing. But no, <laughs> it's again and again. Like, oh, this Amanda, she's so far above me, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just such an uneducated hick, etc., etc. And it wasn't helped by the fact that I couldn't stand Amanda. I really couldn't. <laughs> and she was, she was like so haughty and judgmental and so self-righteous uh, that uh, she was always disapproving of something, including the Wild Wild West show she hated because they were exploiting the natives. And Jack said, you know, they make a good wage. And they don't have to be farmers, which they don't like. <laughs> and they get to see the world. But she just doesn't see it that way. I thought of Amanda as kind of a 19th century Karen. So I really couldn't stand her. Although we do find out she's not quite as bad as all that. But I'll leave the reader to see how this turns out. How his uh, star-crossed uh, pining for Amanda eventually resolves itself. As far as ratings, I'm going to give the Little Big Man, the book, the first book from 1964, five years out of five. It is fantastic. It is fun. There's very little I can find fault with. The movie, four and a half. It's still pretty great, but it doesn't quite do the book justice. The sequel, uh, four years, maybe three and a half. I just really got frustrated with it. It was so long-winded in times, and I kept keeping, when is he going to make a move on Amanda? I mean, I don't like her, but what the heck? <laughs> he deserves to have another wife. He's lost the first two, so what the heck? But, you know, I think the biggest problem was that the first book was so brilliant, it was just really hard to measure up. So this has been my review of Thomas Berger's Little Big Man, the sequel, Return of Little Big Man, and the movie, based on the first book. Please let me know what you think about it in the comments below, whether you saw the movie or read the book and, and whether you liked it or not, and whether you have any other similar books that you would recommend, and if you know if there's a term for that kind of book or story or movie when the character moves through history as a kind of observer. So please like and subscribe because that'll help me get out the good steampunk word. For now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary. Thank you.